Mark Stevenson here, Hanger Law, and we're going to do title issues and resolutions part one. I think I did this a few months ago, but um, I kind of flew through it and it's great content. So if you were at that session, um, hopefully this is a good refresher for you. If you weren't at that session, then it'll be most of it will be brand new. Uh, let me do my screen share here. All right, so everyone should be able to see that uh, title issues and resolutions part one. Um, you know, put something in the chat box if you can't, um, but I think uh, that should be good here. Yep. All right. And just a quick overview, Hangar Law, um, located in Virginia Beach and Newport News. We have two offices and uh, around eight attorneys, uh, eight or so, of, I'm sorry, 10 attorneys, eight or so of those do real estate work. Um, and so you might have seen Sean, uh, Sean Riley, John Napier, Hunter Hanger, Lindsey Barton, uh, Ashley Grant, myself and Gina McMurray, as well as John Captain. So we got quite a few real estate folks and happy to help you and your uh, um, clients with your real estate needs. So the objective today is common title issues for purchases and sales. We're going to talk about resolutions and then preventative measures uh, in those title issues. So I understand, you know, there is going to be a lot of legal jargon here, um, but the goal is for you all to just gain as much knowledge as possible. And so when you deal with these issues with your clients and with your deals, you'll have some of the basic terminology, you'll understand some of the basic concepts. So when you're talking to your settlement agent or your attorney, about these, you'll again, more knowledge is better. Knowledge is power. You'll have more power. You'll be more equipped to get your deals closed. So for today, we're going to talk about unreleased deeds of trust, judgment liens, encroachments, tax issues, and contractor repairs and mechanics liens. So, uh, you know, maybe you're thinking to yourself, oh yeah, I've had these situations before, or maybe you're thinking, oh no, I've never heard of these. You will most likely eventually if you keep doing deals, so you'll <laughs> deal with this stuff. Also, uh, in part two, which I can do another time, we could talk about illegal subdivision, uh, estate issues, corporate entities, bankruptcy, and random miscellaneous real estate issues that we see. All right, so um, so what is clear title anyway? So in the RAIN contract, uh, I think it's paragraph, I always forget this, paragraph 14, I believe. Um, anyway, in the RAIN contract, the, the seller is certifying that they are conveying clear and marketable title. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, in, in Denton v. Browntown Valley, uh, in, it was a Virginia Beach case, um, the court said that marketable title is free from liens or encumbrances. There are no serious defects, um, that the seller is not going to expose the purchaser to the hazard of litigation. Um, and then also that the purchaser will be able to sell or mortgage the property at its fair value uh, whenever they uh, they decide to do that. So the whole point here is as a seller and, and the rain contract specifically states this, they are certifying to all parties, to the buyer, that they the buyer can take over the property, purchase the property, and there's not going to be any liens or defects on the title. So the general process is that the uh, settlement agent, which would be you know hangar law or, or the appropriate title company, once we receive the contract, then we have a licensed title examiner that performs the title search. We go back around 30 to 40 years when we do the title search to make sure there are a few um, uh, exceptions to that, but generally speaking, 30 to 40 years uh, to make sure that, again, title is clear. What do we search? We search the seller's names and variations of their names. So that's why sometimes it comes up if um, the seller has a, a, a typical or common name, such as Smith, William, something like that then uh, there could be some judgments that pop up for a different person with a similar name because we search all the variations. We also search the property address and the tax ID number uh, um, associated with that, uh, that property at the, in the city. Um, the seller may also perform an owner's title search, which just means the seller can uh, become aware of any preliminary issues that are connected to their name or to their property. Um, not all sellers do this, but sometimes, uh, you know, we will do a seller search um, just in case they think they may have some clouded title and it's good to, to get a heads up on that. All right. So it's always the buyer's settlement company's responsibility. So, you know, why do we care about this anyway? Well, you know, again, the rain contract talk, 
talks about this um, as far as the seller conveying title, but the seller is responsible to, to clear title. And so if their title defects, it's on the seller, it's on the seller's attorney to help with that. The title defects, um, uh, even if it's from a previous homeowner, the title defects run with the land. So that's in quotes there. That's a legal term that we use. It runs with the land. It stays on the land title until it's taken care of and cleared off of title. So that's why it's so important when someone purchases a home that we clear title from a pre, from the seller or from any previous sellers, because otherwise if we don't, it's going to stay with the title and run with the land going forward. And then it becomes potentially your client's problem if it's not taken care of properly. So that's why we always recommend title insurance. We work with our, our local title insurance company to uh, provide that title insurance uh, policy for the lender and also hopefully for the seller, I'm sorry, for the owner, which would be the purchaser. So lender's title and owner's title. Um, in most companies, uh, I'm sorry, in most cases, the title insurance company will pay for claims against the property. So the homeowner does not have to. That's the biggest reason why we always recommend owner's title policy. So if for whatever reason, there's a, a, a title issue that's missed or a, a title issue that comes up after closing later on in uh, as the purchaser owns the property, then they have that title insurance. The title insurance company will go to bat for them. They'll pay out the claims and um, the, uh, the homeowner won't be sued and won't have to pay out those claims. So again, lender's policy and owner's policy. It's a one-time premium paid at closing, which covers title for the entire duration that the homeowner owns the home. Uh, Mark, I'm just going to interrupt a second. We just had a few more people join. Make sure you put your full name and your real estate license number in the chat session to get credit, please. So just continuing on with the title insurance, the title company will defend the homeowner from claims by third parties. So very important to get. It's a, again, one-time premium. It's not a renewal thing that the uh, buyers have to pay every year. It's not like homeowner's insurance in that respect. Um, all right, so let's get into topic one with that background info, unreleased deeds of trust. So what I'll do is I'm gonna give you a few basic, um, uh, just pieces of information regarding each title issue, and then we'll do some examples. So in, in the examples, you could type out your response. I'm not gonna have everyone chime in um, with their audio, but you could type in responses if you want to, or if you just wanna sit back and listen, that's great too. Um, so deeds of trust, they're also called mortgages or the security instrument. Um, typically a previous homeowner's mortgage that was not released property. So when I say an unreleased deed of trust, it was a previous, generally a previous homeowner uh, had a mortgage. It was either never paid off or it was paid off. And the bank or the lending institution never released it properly with the city clerk's office. So if it's not released properly, to us from title standpoint, it looks like it's still open and it's still out there. So um, that comes up a lot. It was paid off, especially in the 2008 to 2011 range when a lot of the banks were closing or Bank of America took over countrywide and all these other banks. There, um, if someone paid off their mortgage between 2008 and 2000, uh, 2011, uh, a lot of those um, what we call certificate of satisfactions or lien releases got lost in the shuffle or were never filed. And so it looks like the person never paid off their mortgage. So you always wanna get some type of proof that you paid off a mortgage. And so this is, uh, this is why. Um, so possible resolutions, we can ask the seller for their owner's title policy. That helps, again, going back to why we need owner title. If the owner's title doesn't work or they don't have their policy or they can't find it or they never bought it, then we'd have to go through the um, lien release process and the, the seller's settlement agent or settlement attorney would most likely work with the seller to go through that process to get that mortgage released. Okay. So those are the basics. Let's look at some examples here. So seller Sally is under contract on 100 main street. She purchased the home in 2016. The title search comes back and there's an unreleased deed of trust from Wells Fargo from 2010. Okay. Dates are important here. Her current mortgage is with bank of America. And she purchased an owner's title policy in 2016. Buyer Bob obviously wants to close this as soon as possible. How do we solve this? All right, if you want to type in any 
These are super basic, so don't overthink it. Let me see if I can see the chat box here. There we go. Chat. All right. I got my chat box up here. No one's taking a stab at it. Ah, there we go. Thanks, Stacy. <laughs> I knew someone had it in them. So you definitely want to request the owner's title policy um, to see if that is covered. More likely than not, we can use the owner's title policy. All right, that's easy enough. But next example, continued seller, seller Sally can't find her owner's policy. So that was the first option. Um, we still need can, we still can try to track down yep go back to previous closing agent we can still try to track down the title policy just because the owner doesn't have it doesn't mean we can't find it somewhere so we could try to track it down um otherwise the last option would be to go back to wells fargo and uh, ask for that release which is easier said than done Sorry, I'm moving my windows around here. All right, any questions on that? So ask for the owner's title policy. If you can't find a policy, try to find it. If you can't find it, then you gotta go back to the source. All right, unreleased deed of trust, example B, Sally's under contract on 100 Main Street. She purchased the home in 2010. The title search comes back and there's an unreleased deed of trust from Ditech from 2015 when she refined. It's getting a little bit trickier. Her current mortgage is with Bank of America. She purchased an owner's title policy in 2010, but that does not help with the refinance in 2015. Buyer Bob wants to close as soon as possible, which is the case every time. How do we solve this? Okay, so we just added another wrinkle in here. We have the uh, refinance. Pretty simple answer here. Three, two, one. So they'll need to work with Ditech to get that released. All right. Owner's policy doesn't cover that because she refinanced after she purchased in 2010. Um, so yeah, Ditech will need to issue a release for that. Which another thing I want to mention is these are real life examples. So, um, I mentioned these banks because we work with them a lot, but uh, yeah, Ditech, that happens a lot. And um, real life example, this comes up all the time. Example C, seller Sally's under contract on 100 Main. She purchased the home in 2010. It was a new construction. Title comes back and there's a $6 million deed of trust still attached to the property from the builder. Buyer Bob wants to close ASAP. How do we solve this one? All right, new construction. So I added a few more changes here. New construction, very large deed of trust. That's the builder's deed of trust from when they purchased the land. Um, you know, it's generally from Town Bank or Bayport or Old Point or, you know, some local bank like that. The builder can go in there, clear the land and start building their houses. Any stabs at that? Don't overthink it. They essentially need to get a partial release, all right, partial release for that particular lot, all right? So the $6 million deed of trust is on the entire uh, development. So what they do is the, the construction company would release or the bank would release um, the mortgage just for that particular lot. It's called a partial release. Okay, questions on that? Everyone's still following? <laughs> People are like, oh man, there's a way above my head. No, I'm trying to keep it simple for you. Trying to keep it simple. All right, so that's unreleased deeds of trust. Again, old mortgages um, that are still appearing on title that need to be taken care of so that the seller can convey clear title. All right, judgment liens. Let's talk about these. These are a little bit easier. So generally, if someone does not pay a debt per, per a contract, 
the creditor can file a judgment lien against the debtor. The debtor is typically the seller in, in our examples and record it where property is located. So this is a check and balance for folks that don't pay their debt. I mean, that's, that's legal. The, um, you know, I'll just pick on credit card companies for a while. They can uh, hire an attorney. The attorney can try to uh, file a, a judgment against the seller. And if they win and the debt is unpaid, then a lien can be attached to the property. And we call this a judgment lien. If someone does not own property, then um, they can't attach a lien to the property. So, um, so again, if you own property, though, they, they can use that as collateral to uh, try to force people to pay their, their debts. So 100% legal and it happens all the time. So we see this with credit cards, medical debt, HOA um, liens, and then also civil cases, judicial cases, child support, personal injury cases, other civil suits. Let's see some examples here. So Sally, um, so this is a little bit trickier here. Sally S. Smith is the seller. She's under contract on 1100 Atlantic. Title comes back and there are three medical judgments from Sentara that may be attached to the property. She claims they are not hers. However, she does remember an ER visit at Sentara Hospital 10 years ago, but she thought she paid all the bills. One of the judgments is for Sally S. Smith, and two of the judgments are for Sally Q. Smithson. So remember, when I talked about earlier, when we do a title search, we search all variations of the name. So that's why when we type in Smith, it'll come up with Smithson and other variations. When we type in Sally, it'll come up with Sally and all the middle initial variations, because we want to make sure we don't miss anything. So anyone have any quick solution to how we can figure this out? Does Sally S. Smith, does she need to pay all those? Um, you know, do we just take her word for it? Oh, I paid all the bills, so that's fine. All right, Stacy, thanks for your participation. Hospital should be able to confirm. Good, good comments, Sarah, thank you. So basically, those are all good comments. We need to just confirm first and foremost whether she paid. So we would need her help contacting Sentara, you know, for medical HIPAA purposes. We would need to get her authorization. We could find out if they're paid or not. If they are showing not paid, then she would have to um, pay those and we could put them on the settlement statement. And the other one, uh, Sally Q. Smithson, we would do a judgment affidavit. And Sally S. Smith would essentially claim that she is not Sally Q. Smithson, and then we could exclude those from title. But yeah, the one the one judgment for her, we just need to make sure it's paid, and all that has to be confirmed before she can sell the property. Okay, good comments. Yeah, if she can prove that she paid it, Christine, 100%. Uh, after the property sold, Letitia, I think I understand your question. Sorry, I would say the answer is no, if I understand your question properly. Um, after the property sold. I'm not sure, Letitia. Sorry about that. I, I don't want to give you a, a bad answer. I don't quite understand the question. Um, I'll open up at the end for five to ten minutes so we can do some more Q and A. All right, example B, sorry, let me move over here. I'm juggling on a small laptop screen, so sorry about that. Um, example B, judgment liens. Sally's under contract on 1100 Atlantic. Uh, she's rented the property for the past year and the tenants just moved. Title comes back and there's an HOA lien on the property. Further, HOA dues are delinquent for the past few months. Clearly the tenants were not paying HOA dues. How can this be solved? Simple answer here, HOA liens attached to the property, you gotta pay your dues in Virginia. Um, so that's between the, uh, that's on the landlord for not making sure those were paid. And so those will have to be paid upon sale of the property or prior to sale of the property. 
Yep. Yep, Christine. I got another question here about the private lender. Um, Christine asked me about if the private lender doesn't exist anymore. So that'd be like an unreleased deed of trust. Um, great question. Somewhere, some way, uh, we most loans are transferred. And so that has come up sometimes before Christine, but we have to exhaust a lot of different options before we can just write something off or uh, not get some type of payoff for it. So um, great question that comes up every so often, but um, uh, it's more complicated answer than I could give you. But yes, we have to try to get that paid off or get a release for it. All right, example C, Solly's under contract on 1100 Atlantic, title comes back clear, finally, and they close on October 1, 2019. However, she had some financial difficulty that summer and was late on a credit card payment to Capital One. The new owners receive a judgment lien notice at the property on November 1st against seller Sally in favor of Capital One. How can this be resolved? All right, so they close on October 1, but then a judgment lien notice is sent after the closing on November 1. Do the buyers have any liability is really the main question. Any stabs? Everyone's thinking. All right, good, good, good uh, attempt, Stacy. So thankfully, in this situation, regardless of title insurance, because the closing already took place and the lien was filed after closing, Sally does not own the property anymore, and so it will not attach to 1100 Atlantic. However, if she has any other properties, that judgment lien could potentially attach to those new properties. But for this particular instance, the buyers are, um, the buyers have no liability and the prop, the uh, lien does not attach. Example D, Sam, uh, seller Sam and Sally Smith are under contract on 1100 Atlantic. Title comes back and there's a one credit card judgment from Capital One that may be attached to the property. Thankfully, they've owned the home for 25 years and the credit card judgment was recorded 22 years ago. Okay, dates matter here. Uh, how can this be resolved? So potential Capital One judgment, they've owned it for 25 years and then there's a credit card judgment from 22 years ago. So this is a little bit tricky, more nuanced, um, but generally speaking in Virginia, there's a 20 year statute of limitation for judgments. Um, so yep, Stacy was bringing that up and uh, yep, Sarah. So there's 20, generally 20 years. Um, and there's two things going on here, 20 years and they've been married for the entire time they own the house. Um, and so they are protected as long as the judgment is only on um, one of them, if there's a judgment on both of them for Sam and Sally, then they would potentially have to pay that. So that's something we would check. If it's only in Sam's name, it wouldn't attach anyway. If it's only in Sally's name, it wouldn't attach. If it's both of their names, it would attach. But then we have the 20 year statute of limitations. So, yep. All right, next one, this is even more tricky. Uh, why would it attach if it's, if it's in both of their names, Kara? Because that's just what the law says. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, that's just what the law states. Um, and so there's a title protection uh, for married couples unless it's both of their names. So that's why we always ask uh, when people are buying a house, if they're buying as a married couple, um, because it, it affords the extra, extra protection for the judgments uh, for the individuals. But again, 20 year statute of limitations, they most likely would not have to pay that anyway. Uh, but again, we assess all that. Uh, okay, next one here. So a little bit trickier. This comes up sometimes and it's super frustrating. Sam and Sally Smith are under contract again. Variation, they initially took title as husband and wife, but they divorced two years ago. All right, Sally's been living there for the past two years, paying all expenses per the divorce decree. 
Unfortunately, there was no deed recorded. So we call it a deed pursuant to divorce. And basically what that would mean is um, in these situations, a, a good family divorce attorney would have them sign a deed pursuant to divorce, giving the property to the other person legally and recording that deed. A lot of times they don't do that. And it's uh, simply they're, they're relying on the divorce decree, which is half the battle. All right. So title comes back and there's a credit card judgment from Capital One for the husband, Sam Smith, from one year ago. So how can this be resolved? So they were divorced two years ago, judgment from one year ago. That's a problem. So according to Virginia law, once they file that divorce and they have a divorce decree, then that severs their tenancy in the property. So instead of owning as a married couple, they now own as Sam Smith individual, Sally Smith individual, going back to what um, I think it was Kara was, yeah, Kara was bringing up uh, in the last example. Now they do not own the title as a married couple. And so what happens to that Capital One judgment? It attaches to the property. What happens to Sally? She has to figure out how she can pay for that or, or get Sam to come back into the picture uh, and, and pay for that somehow, some way. Um, yep, needs to be paid. So anytime you're working with divorce folks or um, especially folks going through divorce that's not yet finalized, think to yourself, all right, we need to get a, a deed signed and get the property granted to the uh, party that is taking care of the home and is living in the home. Assuming that's what the divorce decree states. Most of the time, there's one person that's responsible for the house that's living there, that's paying the um, expenses and all that. So, uh, you know, we need to review the divorce decree. Most likely we can do a deed and this could potentially help with these issues. All right, that's a super specific point, but it, it does come up a lot. All right, encroachments, these are fun. <clears throat> So all, uh, all this means is that a structure is impeding on someone's property boundary, whether it's a fence, a home, a structure, part of the home, the driveway, a shed, or some detached structure, or some other structure. Um, and the only way to find this out legally is to do a property boundary survey. And so we get a licensed surveyor that goes out there, measures all the um, lot lines, compares it with the deed, compares it with the development of the property, and they can determine if certain structures are encroaching on another person's property. All right, so it comes up every so often. We mostly see it in the rural areas. We mostly see it in, <coughs> excuse me, in the older neighborhoods. Um, we see it in Norfolk a lot. We see it in Hampton a lot, um, where the, the houses are kind of tight together. Uh, and so that comes up. All right, um, example A, buyer Bob ratifies an offer on 100 Main. There are no fences in the backyard. Bob notices a decently sized shed towards the back of the lot that appears to be on the neighbor's property. <clears throat> but it's hard to be sure. How should this be resolved? So super simple answer. Survey, Una won. She was fast. Get a survey. They're generally around $400 for a lot. Um, we always recommend them in our engagement letters when buyers are buying. They're not required in Virginia. Some states do require those. I kind of wish they would require them here, but um, they don't. So it's an optional thing. And uh, it's up to the buyer to get a survey. If the buyer does not get a survey, then um, it's kind of a buyer beware thing and they have to deal with it later. <clears throat> Example B, buyer Bob ratifies an offer on 100 Main. His yard has a fence in the adjacent neighbors. Uh, sorry, I can't see. There we go. All right, there we go. Adjacent neighbors all have a fence and all of the fences, the neighbor's fences end at a different point. Okay, so um, this example is not very clear, but um, they back up to a grassy area and a pond. So we're talking about all the adjacent um, houses next to each other and their fences end at different points, okay? So it's kind of hard to be sure where his lot ends at the back. Um, 
because there's a grassy area and there's a pond back there. So Bob is curious as to whether that land is his or not. How should this be resolved? So just think of a typical neighborhood scenario with a pond and a fence um, that backs up to the pond. Survey again, Una got it. <laughs> That's right, yeah, just get a survey. Just get a survey. I mean, if all the if all the fence lines all matched up, then you could potentially assume that that's where the property ended. Um, but best way to be sure is get a survey because sometimes those in those situations, their yard runs all the way up to the water, or it all the way runs to the um, run, I'm sorry, runs all the way to the uh, through the water, and so they could potentially have water access, and then it's waterfront, right? And so you just lost a uh, hundred thousand dollars on your listing because you didn't list it as waterfront so anyway <laughs> that was a joke but yeah if any house is close to water um it's good to get a survey and you can kind of see where the lot lines are all right um c here this is a fun one Buyer Bob ratifies an offer on 1100 mill swamp in smithfield all right anyone know that road out there um, a lot of horse lots out there. Um, it's a five acre parcel with very little fencing. Buyer Bob is a horse enthusiast and needs every inch of the land for his horses. Bob noticed his neighbor Nancy's horse riding ring, sorry, Nancy's horse riding ring, maybe encroaching on his property towards the back of the lot. So he orders a survey. Sure enough, the survey shows the encroachment on his parcel by 20 feet. Buyer Bob still wants the property without the encroachment. And how can this be resolved? <clears throat> All right, any takers on that? Two, two options here, option A and op option B. Um, if, if anyone's familiar with horse riding rings, they're uh, basically large fenced in areas that are portable. Um, so they're like metal gates kind of, and you can move them and they're portable. They're not generally they're not um, uh, anchored down to the ground because if a horse hits it, then it, they can move it. And so anyway, um, so option A is just to get and ask Nancy to move her fence over the horse, I'm sorry, the horse riding ring over to her lot. Okay, so if it's 20 feet, she could just move it 25 feet over and hopefully it'd be in her lot. Um, the other option would be the seller would have to file suit against Nancy if she did, if she did, um, claims that no, that's her lot. Um, obviously, show her the survey. Uh, then the seller would have to file some type of suit against her lawsuit, stating that she's encroaching. Yep, certified letter is a great idea with um, the survey. So th this is on the seller too. So hopefully, the seller has some type of relationship with Nancy um, to where they could discuss that. All right, number four. So are any quick questions on those encroachments? Those are just a few basic examples, pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but again, just going back to my first couple slides, if there's an issue, the seller has the liability and the responsibility to take care of those issues. So um, even though the buyer wants to purchase the property, it's on the seller to convey this property with no title issues. All right, let's talk about taxes for a little bit. So delinquent city taxes, deferred city taxes, or IRS liens. Um, so these issues come up. Absolutely, they have to be taken care of. We cannot mess around with taxes. Um, so let's talk about some examples here. Seller Susie is under contract on 100 Main Street. Title comes back and there are $2,000 of delinquent taxes that need to be paid. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Susie was hoping to break even on the transaction before she heard about the taxes. How do we resolve this? Got to pay it. <laughs> Stacy's correct. Super simple. Um, Got to get those paid. So unfortunately, Susie was not um, aware of those or she forgot about those or something of that nature. Um, 
She has to get those paid. Paragraph 7C of the RAIN contract states that she would be able to um, bring any funds to closing. Uh, so if she was, so say you did a seller net sheet for her, which I hope all of you listing agents do, do that seller net sheet for them. Um, if she was breaking even, according to your seller net sheet, you most likely did not know of this $2,000. And so maybe she has to bring $2,000 to closing. Again, paragraph 7C of the RAIN contract states that she has to be able to bring that money. And if she does not have that money, hopefully she can get it because otherwise she's in breach of the contract. Example B, Susie's under contract on 100 Main again. She's elderly and filed for exempt or deferred taxes with the city in 2016. What, if anything, needs to be done? So for this example, um, I'm gonna do exempt. Well, sorry, I'm gonna do deferred. Exempt is really for military folks. So I'm gonna, that's a different example. In this one, um, we're gonna do deferred taxes. So she's elderly and filed for deferred taxes with the city in 2016. What if anything needs to be done? <clears throat> so pretty straightforward on this one. Unfortunately, deferred taxes do have to get paid upon a conveyance. So it's kind of a cheap deal in my opinion. And this is a Virginia thing. Um, so I blame it on the lawmakers in Virginia. I don't like this. They defer it, but any type of conveyance, um, whether it's a deed, whether it's an estate conveyance, those taxes have to be caught up. So it kind of, I mean, I see why they did it. It helps the individual. Maybe they're on a fixed income and it does help the individual in the current moment. So they don't have to pay taxes, but they just keep stacking up with zero interest. Um, they keep stacking up over time. So if you know grandma sells a property, um, you know, later on down the line, then uh, those have to be caught up. So I don't like that, but that's the way it is. Um, the difference though, like with some military folks are exempt taxes. And um, so Stacy, that would be the situation with exempt taxes is they would not have to be caught up, but deferred taxes have to be caught up and paid. <clears throat> All right, let's look at this one, a little bit more nuanced here. Buyer Betsy is currently renting a nice high-rise condo in Virginia Beach Town Center. She's now under contract on 100 Main Street to purchase. She owns her own business and has made a great uh, salary the past few years. Unfortunately, she owes the IRS about $20,000 in taxes and they filed a tax lien against her. What if anything needs to be done so she can close on her new home on 100 Main? Yep, thanks, Thomasina. Put your name and license number for anyone that hopped in. Una, uh, pay off the debt, okay. It's a little bit tricky because I kind of switched from seller to buyers now in this situation. Sarah, nothing if the lender allows, okay. So I scared everybody with the, with the IRS debt and you should be scared if you see anyone that has IRS debt. Um, Stacy set up payment plan with IRS to use to qualify DTI. So that's a, that's a good suggestion too. So the short answer is what Sarah said, nothing if the lender allows. So um, generally speaking, as long as the lender's aware of it and they're able to work out, um, you know, it's not gonna affect their debt to income, which that was a great point, Stacy. Um, then yes, she can go ahead and purchase. However, what Betsy needs to be aware of is if she does not pay that IRS debt off when she goes to sell the property, it will attach to that 100 Main Street. So it doesn't really, it should not really affect her on the purchase unless the lender doesn't allow it. Um, but when she goes to sell it, it would attach. Now, hopefully she can get it paid off in a short amount of time and it would not attach to her property. So... So yeah, I flipped the script a little bit, switching to the, the buyer side on that. But yes, yeah, she absolutely needs to pay it as quickly as possible. It does not affect her renting situation, <clears throat> again, because she does not own the property. 
And that's something too, you know, we always let the, the buyer know um, if there's something like that, that comes up on title or comes up on her record. It's not on title, so to speak, because she doesn't own the property yet. I have told people, Hey, we're, we can still close on the property. Just be aware, go ahead and get this paid off. Cause otherwise the lien will attach to the property. All right, this is the last section here. I'm gonna kind of blow through this because it's super complicated, but I wanna just give you all some kind of um, really quick overview of, of contractor and mechanics lien work. Honestly, we could probably have a whole hour session on this, but um, for those of you that deal with general contractors, uh, you know, maybe pay closer attention. Um, this is all very legal, very nuanced. So definitely get an attorney involved if you have any situations like these. Um, but there's a whole code, Virginia Code Section 43.4, that deals with contractor mechanics liens. It's a, an entire law school class that we take um, on this. So again, super complicated, but there's some main time periods that you want to be aware of and some main points. So uh, I'm just pointing you to this code section. If you're, again, if you work with general contractors, read through this code section when you have free time, right, um, this holiday season uh, or in January when things are slow um go through this but the the main points i want to cover i'll get to here in a second um but there's a 90 day period that's important um and there's a any general contractor if they're getting a building permit they need to designate an mla an mla is a mechanics lien agent that generally needs to be a um a banking institution or a law firm or an attorney uh, and so what that means is is the mechanics lien agent is the individual that the contractor, I'm sorry, the subcontractor would have to send notice to in order to secure the right to potentially be able to get paid, <laughs> okay? So it protects the general contractor, it protects the owner. If there's some type of dispute with the subcontractor's payment, they would have to send notice to the mechanics lien agent in order to, like I said, secure their spot in line to, to get their paycheck. So hopefully, you know, when work is done, the general contractor would um, pay all the subs and, and take care of that. But there are instances where money is tight for certain general contractors. They don't pay the sub out in time. And so the sub could attempt to file a mechanics lien so they can get paid. All right, so notice must be given to the mechanics lien agent within 30 days after the contractor begins work if the contractor wants to preserve its right to lien for all of their labor and materials. Okay, so let's just say um, <clears throat> the, it was a roof, it's a roof job, you know, let's just say it's a super nice roof, $20,000 roof. And, um, you know, the, the subcontractor is like, hey, I've been burned before. So they would start working on the roof within 30 days of working on the roof. They send notice to the mechanics lien agent and say, hey, I'm preserving my right uh, to a lien for this property for this $20,000 roof and all the labors and labor and materials. And that's the proper way to do it. If the subcontractor does not send notice to the mechanics lien agent within that 30 day window, then it's much more difficult for them to um, secure their right to get paid. So that's why this is really important. Um, also, the other point of that and the other side of that is the contractor definitely needs to designate a mechanics lien agent um, prior to, to performing any work. If they don't, then again, it makes it easier for the subcontractors to uh, squirrel their way in there and, um, and file a lien on the property. All right, so there's protections for, this is the cool thing about this um, statute section. There are protections for all parties. There's protections for the owners, the contractors, and the subcontractors, and they all kind of work hand in hand together. So that's why you'll see on, um, well, I'll go through this main point too, and then I'll wrap up with one comment. All contractors must file mechanics liens and land records within 90 days of the last supply of labor. So, so there's a 30 day time period that's important. There's a 90 day time period that's also important. And not later than 90 days from the time such building or structure is completed and work is terminated. So that's why a lot of times the practical part of this is when someone is selling their house, we always ask them as a settlement firm, hey, was any work performed in the last 90 days on the house that hasn't been paid for? If the work's been paid for and they can 
provide receipts or if they're paying for it on the settlement statement, that's great. But if there's outstanding work that hasn't been paid for, then we have to, or that that is not planned to be paid for, then um, we have to account for that because of potential mechanics lien issues after closing. So this, the mechanics liens, they, so unlike that previous example from the beginning, <clears throat> the main takeaway here is mechanics liens can carry through and attach to the property through the sale of the home. And so that's why this is so important. We don't want any mechanics liens coming up after we close on the property. So if you remember anything at all from the mechanics lien is that, it's that they can last through the closing. We wanna make sure we get all uh, contractors and subcontractors paid prior to closing or at closing. Um, and then lastly, privity of contract must be with the owner of the home. So the, con the general contractor um, must sign a uh, you know, service contract with the owner of the home. If they sign it with anybody else or if there's no contract or if you know, there's other assignments going on, then they cannot file a mechanics lien. So generally the homeowner is stating they want certain work done. They sign a contract with the GC and um, then they're able to file uh, mechanics liens at that point. Me mechanics liens have high lien priority in Virginia and mechanics liens can survive uh, property transfers, which is what I mentioned. And so we and title companies discuss a 120 day period, uh, again, because there's exceptions to the 90 day period, but generally speaking, after 120 days, you're safe uh, as far as any mechanics lien issues. All right, so I know there's a lot. I know it's super confusing, but um, just some highlights there. We have some examples. I'm not going to go through all these, um, but uh, happy to send these out to you all to review later if you want to. Um, I did want to open it up nine minutes or so to get you done by 12. If you have any questions on any of these examples, um, let me know. Any questions at all? Is everyone still awake? Is everyone thinking about lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions at all? Any questions? No? Tammy says great class. Yeah, I think I think so too. He does a really good job. He does a really good job. Thank um, you, can you Tammy. click on uh, Mark? Can you Next click time, the Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Next time, Thomasina, we will do. Um...